Okay, let's get started. Can you? Oh, that's awkward. I like to pace around. Um, so I'm Daniel. I'm the Intel Graphics Maintainer in the Kernel. And uh, this talk is kind of a funny title because uh, at least if you look at quantity over quality, so uh, like how many patches I merged each kernel release, I think for the past few years I've been somewhere in the top 10 list. And I'm going to do a talk about uh, maintainers don't scale. And I'm one who has shown that maintainers do scale. And one year ago, I would have definitely said, there's no problem with the maintainer process. I, I, don't, I didn't even script get apply to make it all work. Uh, so what I want to talk about is kind of the journey over the past roughly one year. Uh, where we started doing some experiments in how we maintain 9 and 15. Uh, what I expected to happen, what actually happened, and what changed, and why I kind of came to the conclusion that maintainers do actually have some scalability problems, which is not that obvious. So, like I said, I, I didn't see a problem. Applying patches was easy, even lots of patches, and we have Greg here who applies like five times more patches than I ever did, and he doesn't seem to have a problem with that either. So why did I have a, why did I see a problem? There's really two. One is I had a co-maintainer for about two years, he's, or three, anyway, two, three years. He's doing a great job, but he kind of always refused to be on the hook for features. Uh, he's, he's doing all the bug fix handling and, and, and handling things when I'm on vacation and all these things. But he, he didn't want to be on, on the hook for it. So I, I just had the plus factor of one, despite being a team. And even two people is kind of not enough. So I tried to sign up a third co-maintainer. And we have a big team, about 15 people, uh, that core team at Intel Graphics. And uh, I think I asked about five or so, and they all declined. For various reasons. So there, there seems to be a bit of PR problem, at least, with being a kernel maintainer. It's not the most popular job. And, and the other problem was there was a bit of perception of, of running git apply. Uh, I mean, I think in my entire time as Intel maintainer, I never reviewed the majority of patches. So that's, that's always been done by other people. And, and so, People ask me, can you please apply this patch? And I always reply, no, I'm not going to apply this patch. Just this person who needs to review it first. And once it's reviewed, I'm going to pick it up. Of course, like two days later, can you apply this patch? No, the review hasn't happened yet. And, and somehow I was singing the same song all the time for like years. And new base managers just like never got it. So running get the play inbox is like not a problem. Not a problem, but... Somehow people thought there was a problem. And by thinking there's a problem, they made it a problem. Because they were always talking to me. So, uh, in a way, I did have a bit of a, 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 an issue. With, I would have liked to get more people involved, but somehow that didn't happen. So, uh, the usual solutions we have in the kernel communities, I think there's about two. And one is you do a lot of sub maintainers and topic trees, which I tongue in cheek like called the arm sock model. And uh, we have a bunch of x86 DRM graphics people who switched over to, to, to doing graphics drivers on ARM, and they're not happy because somehow you have your nice driver and then you need six bazillion trees to get all your infrastructure land. So, and uh, the other thing is, it, it wouldn't fix the problem because instead of kind of a team with maybe three, four maintainers, I would then have maybe a team with four, three, four sub maintainers and all a plus factor of one. That, that, didn't, that wouldn't have improved things. And, and kind of the third reason why I don't like sub maintainers and topic trees is, uh, let's say i915 has maybe a bit of churn problem. We change code way too fast. And so after two weeks of having a topic tree, the merges essentially become unmanageable. It moves too fast. So 
topic trees, I think, that have caused lots of bureaucratic problems and not solved any of the ones I, ha I wanted to fix. And, and the other one is just more script, which is kind of, I guess, the GREC, the GREC KH model. Uh, I never had really scripts to, to, I applied patches individually. And so there was lots of room to, to kind of scale by the day. Uh, but again, that was not, my problem with applying or scaling the, the patch application uh, process was not that I spent too much time on it, it was that everyone spent too much time pinging me about it. So I, I, I don't think that would have like fixed anything either. And so one year ago, there was Kernel Summit, and there was some random discussion floating around, and, and Linus made the statement that he really likes group maintainership models. And uh, so I figured, maybe if I can't sign up a third co-maintainer because they don't like it, uh, let's sign up 15 because then they can hide behind each other. And then we can say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a full-time maintainer. I'm just one for it. So that, that's just a consensual experiment I, I implemented off the kernel summit, of the discussing with the team and, and, and thinking about it a bit. And I asked Dave earlier, and he said, sure, you a bit nuts. And as long as you give me plausible deniability when it inevitably all blows up, you can try this. And I, I honestly expected I would do this for one kernel release and then just forget about it. Because, I mean, no one else tried it, I think, at least as far as I know. So it must be stupid, right? And the strange thing after one year is a disaster failed to materialize. I mean, of course, there was like the oddball small screw up, but then uh, I've certainly done those too. <laughs> uh, and uh, th the result of what really happened is I have over the top happy contributors. Like, when I, when I chat with managers, when I chat with kind of the lead engineers on my team, somehow they think this is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that it, it solves the second problem too. Instead of everyone asking me, when will you apply this patch? And me telling them, look, you need to really talk with your reviewer and not with me. Uh, they just did that. Because the reviewer now also has like had the keys to the kingdom and can apply the patch. So not, yes, of course, like 95% of the work is reviewing and then you run the script and it's done. But somehow, also giving people the permission to do the, the last 5% of the step, uh, encourage everyone to work together directly. And so now we have kind of an organic mesh of, of people working together directly. And uh, consequence of that is now suddenly we have a really bold maintainer and I'm not sure whether that's a good point. Uh, because yeah, I, I don't spend so much time coordinating people anymore. It just works. I, 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 I read the git logs to see what's going on in areas where I'm not directly involved. Uh, but I notice I still participate in a lot of detailed discussions, do my review in the areas I know, I know really well. Uh, but yeah, all, all the, the nagging and begging and it's gone. When I come back from vacation, I essentially just delete all my mails as, as read and forget about it. Because there have been 15 people who took, took care of everything. And uh, what I also figured out, commit rights are a really powerful carrot. In, in a way, the, the carrot is just symbolic. But dangling that commit rights carrots in front of a bunch of the teams who had a really hard time uh, understanding open source and upstream. We work together with, with Android people who have a, a Windows background for various internal, inter, internal political reasons. And uh, kind of just dangling that commit rights carrot uh, encouraged them, I think, a lot more 
to try to do the real thing. Because essentially the, the criteria for commit rights is you understand how open source works. You, you can work together in a distributed team with external people. You do the review, you fix up your patches on your own. I don't have to care about you. Uh, and then you, then you get commit rights. So suddenly they had really big motivation to do that instead of just complaining that the open source people are hippies and you can't work together with them. And uh, one bonus that I didn't think about at all is at Intel, in the Intel graphics driver, we have, a, we have an integration tree that pulls together the Intel tree and the Intel fixes tree and the sand tree because HDMI sand and stuff like that, the DRM next tree and a bunch of other trees that we kind of need to test the driver. Um, like I said, we have too much churn, so there's lots of conflicts all the time. And now, the way the scripts work, every time you push a new patch, it also rebuilds the integration tree. And so if your patch causes a conflict, the person who knows the code area the best, because they just push, push the patch that causes the conflict, also will resolve the conflict. So more or less, as an accident, I... I I distributed integration tree conflict management. And once it's pushed out, we test that, the CI runs over it, and when I do a need to do a back merge, I send a pull request to Dave and tell them, hey, there's a conflict here. I have a tested merge conflict resolution written by the people who give the most clue about it and, and test it for a few days. I mean, that, that part we already have. So if you look at that, and especially since I'm a board maintainer now, is what, what is left for me to do kind of, as, the, as, the, as the maintainer position? Um, I, I call that kind of maintainer as a service. And in a way, I do, I do all the communication with outside people. So when there's a patch which touches multiple trees or which conflicts with some trees or anything that needs coordination with other trees, that's kind of something I, I do. I, I chat with, with external people. The, the same thing is when someone externally approaches it uh, uh, with, with a patch or something, uh, I'm the person who connects people. So when someone has a patch contribution, I, I figure out who's the best reviewer for this. And then I go to them and tell them, look, you need to work with this person, or if he's kind of on vacation because it takes forever to get your patches landed, here's the, the fallback, and they will take care of it. <coughs> so I kind of do the initial connecting people in, inside and outside. What, what I also do a lot is what I call kind of consensus engineering. When, when a bunch of people are stuck and can't reach agreement, I, I try to get the discussions back on, on a useful track instead of... of some, sometimes discussions end up in a bike shed and, and just doesn't move forward. And I guess that's not really a maintainer service, that's just um, I'm more experienced than many people on the team with, with kind of that open source haggling. Uh, of course, the biggest part is sending out pull requests and doing back merges, so any kind of merge, I still do that uh, exclusively. Uh, again, this is kind of the interaction with the outside world. And finally, I take the blame for everything. Because, yeah, that's kind of my job. So, uh, this is kind of the why and what we did and what kind of happened. And the next part of my talk is all about the ingredients as in what I believe is needed to make this work. Because it's definitely not the be all end all of how to maintain software. And I guess before we move on, any questions this far? Or I guess we have lots. Um, where's the cube? I'll talk about that in the ingredients session because that was one of the questions we had to answer. Because before it was kind of my best judgment. And if you have a team, 
you kind of need to make sure that there's agreement on that. So that's that's really good. I think the other one was over there. No, that's also an ingredient. Uh, so I'm going to talk. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just. Yeah, yeah. So there's a slide about CI. This one. So I still read all the commits just to kind of keep on top of what's happening. I mean, sometimes just scroll through them and notice like refactor file A, file B, file, like some mechanical change across the board. Uh, and then I don't read all of it. So I, I still keep on top because, yeah, I take the blame. <laughs> so I, I still try to make sure I know what's, what's roughly going on. And if there's a mismatch between what's happening and what I expect, uh, I bring that up and uh, we fix it. So, yeah, I guess it's probably best we move on because all the questions are kind of get answered in, in, in the following slide. So, ingredients. What, what I believe you need to make this work, and uh, I think the first part is you need a team. Uh, specifically, non-maintainer reviews pretty much need to be the norm already because Otherwise, you kind of give everyone the keys to the kingdom and at the same time need to train them up on how to do good review. And that's probably a bit too much. Um, I'm slowly rolling out this uh, DRM Intel process model to, to kind of the DRM MISC tree for random refactorings and trivial patches. And there we don't have a, a team of peer reviews, so there it was mostly me applying all the patches and doing most of the review. And uh, building that team of reviewers is definitely needed. And if you don't have it, you'll spend 99% of your time building that, and, and the commit rights don't help, really. It it's, a, it's a good carrot. You can drag or trick a few people into ramping up on, on, on doing reviews and, and reviewing patches and, and pushing them. Uh, but you need that team, I think. If, if you're in a subsystem or a tree or whatever they, you've done or just one, two maintainers have done all the reviews, I don't think this will help you out. And the other bit is it needs to be a consistent group, as in if you have just drive-by contributors that disappear again and then never show up, even if they maybe do big work for one year and then disappear again. Uh, I don't think that works because a lot of the enforcement we have is uh, through kind of social feedback and if people stick around, they don't want to screw up and get bad stares from their team, uh, team, team colleagues and everyone. And if they just want to push their thing and then disappear, uh, I think that that wouldn't, wouldn't work. So, so definitely, I, I think the team of regular, consistent contributors that work together is, is like the key part. And once you have that team, giving them commit rights so that they can directly collaborate and be kind of more efficient that way with a mesh collaboration instead of a lot of communication going through the maintainer, I think helps a lot. So next ingredient is, is docs and tools. We have a dim tool, which goes really well with Git. 
Uh, I started maintaining that just as my own maintainer tool. When, when Yanni came on board as a co-maintainer, we improved it quite a lot. It has like man pages, batch completion, and almost a kitchen sink included. And uh, we also have process documentation. So there's a really long web page that explains what the expectations are, how we expect review to be done. It, it links to kernel doc. A documentation in, 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 in documentation slash uh, they need it and essentially every time someone screws up and that does happen uh, we make sure that this learning experience only needs to happen once per team and not once per committer and either we implement an enforcement check in the tool itself in the in the bash scripts or we at least try to document it so that when the next person comes around they can uh, they can check out things and, and hopefully not repeat the mistake. So I think that was really important. This was especially important a year ago when we started ramping up and kind of first the brave people or the more brave people tried this out and obviously fell on their nerves. And then kind of the more cautious people, they could just read the docs and, and they're safe kind of in the knowledge that the tool has been improved. So... I think tooling and documentation, if you have like a big group, is really important to uh, standardize your expectations and processes. Um, next up is testing and, and CI and especially pre-merge testing. Because uh, with that, that it's, it's kind of really... Well, one consequence of the committer model is you can't rebase anymore. Just doesn't work for technical reasons. And once you can't rebase anymore, you can't pull out really embarrassing stuff anymore. Which means, and mostly the embarrassing stuff that falls through the review cracks is kind of, oops, I've forgotten about this corner case on this platform, and now the driver doesn't boot anymore. Then. But it works everywhere else. And so that's why I think you really need CI to make sure that Nothing else breaks. I think that's that's really the the, the plus side. Uh, we had a bit a struggle with with CI over the past year for random political corporate reasons. We lost the team two times and the server phone. So that that was kind of really painful. But uh, I think this is absolutely needed. You need some bot or something that goes through the mailing list, picks up patches, and makes sure they're not total nonsense. And the way we do that, we have a kind of a patchwork fork, which is Ceres aware and has some integration for tracking for stuff. And uh, I would also say a CI on hardware that you can't virtualize is really hard especially CI on kernel. I mean, all the test cases we have, or most of the test cases we have, try to hunt for race conditions and things like that. That just takes a lot of time to run, uh, which means your CI does not complete within minutes if you run the full thing, but more like in decades, or something close to that. Uh, and, and yeah, but the thing is the graphics community has big ties to user space. Because if you look at a GL driver, it's 10% kernel and 90% user space. And the user space people and team have been doing great CI for a lot longer than we've done that on the kernel. The current system is essentially run by one person at Intel, and it's doing millions of test case runs per day. So it, shockingly, it's better than what the Windows people have in some companies. <laughs> or the proprietary uh, team people. So, and if, if I look at what the, the OpenGL team can do with great CI, it's astonishing. And they, they work the same way the kernel now works with commit rights for uh, essentially all the senior, or all the regular contributors and, and peer review like the kernel. And I think CI is a, is a pre-merge CI and of course also post-merge to, to make sure no regression prep through and gets handled fast is really important, but is really hard. Um, next thing is uh, your question about, so what's the expectation for getting something landed? Um, that's the big thing we did not have documented. 
because it was just understanding between me and my co-maintainer Yanni of a feature just between me and I am generally in agreement with myself. So we, we looked at a few of the models that are out there and there's, there's all kinds of different things. One is called kind of the advice model as in you ask relevant people but then you decide yourself. Then there's the full consensus, as in if someone disagrees it doesn't move forward. There's all kinds of, of voting and democratic and escalation processes, for example, the uh, I think Debian has the technical committee or something and then so we looked at all of these and figured they're all aided too weak as in not strong enough to make sure that crap doesn't get in or silly silly designs and broken designs don't land in the kernel or, or like too bureaucratic for a team of essentially 15 people where everyone knows everyone else. <laughs> And what we ended up with is, is something we call rough consensus, as in it defaults to no action, so if there's full disagreement and, and then just nothing happens. Uh, we require agreement on kind of the end goals and the charger where you want to be with the code and the design. And uh, what we think is acceptable and this is essentially how I've run things before when I was the only committer, is disagreement on how to get there is acceptable. Sometimes you want to refactor this first and then implement like the full solution or you want to start out with a very thin implementation of this, this kind of different way sometimes to get at, at, at the same end goal and reasonable people can disagree on how to get there. So, so that's kind of that's that's why it's called just rough consensus, as in we want agreement on where to go, but it's okay when there's some disagreement on how exactly to get there. Of course, it's it's a fuzzy area, but sometimes the disagreement on how to get there is so strong that it becomes a goal itself, or kind of and the stakeholders for all that are the committers, which are essentially the regular contributors. And uh, the, so that, that's the kind of the positive thing, that's what we expect. And the negative merge criteria is if you push a patch and they're screaming on IRC, you shouldn't have. So, so that's not really useful for people, but it's kind of the criteria and, and the consequences, if you're unsure, in case of that, ask for more review advice, ask for more for, for more acts. And we have kind of the we have somewhat of a hierarchy documented, as in the, the two maintainers are, are the top level acts, and then there's three people for kind of three different areas for the driver who kind of officially domain experts for display, for rendering, and for how management. Uh, and so I'll if, if, if someone is unsure, uh, uh, because it's maybe not, not the area they worked on most, or a or, or new, newerish area or interfaces with something, uh, and they're not sure, sure of it, and when they push this, this will result in a shouting match in IRC. So there's, there's a clear level of, of more acts and review bias and people that they can ping uh, to make sure that what they do is, is acceptable. So. I guess this answers your question. Um, the other bit we notice is bug fix flow. Um, if you have people pushing to the main tree all the time, you realize pretty quickly that trying to push bug fixes only to fixes is extremely painful. Because uh, fixes is still maintained by the maintainers because it's, it's a tree that we occasionally need to rebase. Uh, we really should not push garbage into RC kernels. So we need to be able to just rebase a horrible mistake, a mistake out of there. Um, we, we tried doing things at first with just commit, uh, bug fixes to fixes and everything else to, to next. But like I said, th this resulted in lots of conflicts. People, instead of me being the bottleneck for kind of features, 
uh, Jan as my fixes co-maintainer was the bottleneck for fixes or kind of the next bottleneck. So what we decided to do is essentially the same thing uh, Stable does as in commit to master or oh, next in this case first. And when the patch had a bit of soaking time, like two, three days, Yanni as the fixes maintainer uh, cherry picks them over, which means we never run the risk of losing a bug fix in a merge conflict that went wrong because you can just do git merge dash x hours for a back merge. Because you always know the, the bug fix is already in your tree. And we handle that by using, uh, by parsing the fixes tags in our script, which is, is kind of nice because it encourages people to use the fixes tags, which I think is fairly new-ish two years ago. So, uh, that's kind of the ingredients that over the past year uh, we figured out are needed. Um, kind of what's next? Obviously, uh, this presentation talking about it is one of the things. Uh, I, I want to talk about this at Kernel Summit too. And there's just a few open questions. Uh, one is, how should we encode that kind of process in maintainers? Because DRM Intel has it. Uh, the DRM MISC tree is, is becoming maintained under that model. And there's definitely been confusions by other people when some random person on the internet says, I applied your patch to DRM Intel or DRM MISC, and they're like, you're not the maintainer. So I think there's, there's a, of course, I, I just didn't notice that and step in and say, yes, this is okay, I, I, it's in my tree. But uh, I think it would be useful to have, I don't know, attack or something. Uh, some people suggested that we just add all the uh, committers to the maintainers file, but they don't want that because that kind of publicity and being on the hook and getting CC'd on hundreds of patches per month is what they don't want. This is part of the, the PR problem of being a maintainer, I would say. So, and, and the thing is, it's really the two official maintainers are the people who manage all the external communication. And at least for me, maintainers is the file to figure out how to do, how to get, land something when I'm not part of a group. Because, I, yeah. So, so that would be something which would be nice to fix. The other thing is kind of tree-wide refactorings and stuff versus our bug fix flow. Because sure, it's great if we know that all the Intel patches land in here on Intel next first, but they might be random refactors. And if we do a git merge hours, we run the risk of throwing them away. So it, it hasn't really happened probably more than one, two times. But there was a conflict that I needed to make sure I don't throw away the stuff in the RC kernel for a back merge. But, but that's, that's kind of thing. Uh, for me personally, I think the simple solution would be if anyone who does a tree-wide refactoring just does a stable git, git branch, that he or she submits to Linus, and I can then pull it in. Or I just merge it through Intel trees. I mean, this is for kind of three wide refactorings that don't go in through the individual trees. Because once I back merge, or once I pull in that, that refactoring branch into DRM Intel next, I can do a git merge hours again, and, and the problem is gone. So, but it's not, it's, it, I think it happened like one, two times, so it's not really anything pressing. It can, I'll survive for the next 10 years if we don't change anything. And the other thing is, I guess, uh, I think for leave maintainerships, if you have all the ingredients, so if you have a group, if you have good documentation and tooling, if you have CI, uh, if you have all these bits and pieces, I do think, be not, not because it fixes anything directly, because, but because of kind of that second order effect of encouraging mesh collaboration, it is a, a much more uh, efficient model to maintain leaf trees. So if you don't have any, any, any other maintainers underneath you, uh, you might want to look at this. And, and I, personally, I also believe that some of the super tiny branches we have in some of the areas where there's lots and lots of tree proliferation 
like around the ARM ecosystem might benefit from a bit of that, perhaps. At least that's, that's kind of my perspective from, from the DRM world. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I see new DRM drivers pop up and talk with people who kind of switched uh, to the dark side of the force, writing ARM, ARM SOC graphics drivers. There's, uh, I think there's potential to, to do better, or even better. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's the summary. Uh, like I said, I think it's, it's, it's a much more scalable leaf maintainer model. Uh, it gives you the resilience of a really big group, so I don't have any problems anymore with the bus factor. Because behind me there's 15 other people who could take over, at least as a group. And one of them will probably get volunteered to do the external maintainer coordination and taking blame for it. So in, in a way, by not calling it maintainership, I'm going to manage to train 15 more people as, uh, on, uh, or put 15 more people on the apprentice maintainer track. Uh, given that over the past year no one screamed from the current uh, kernel community, uh, I would say it does integrate really well into the maintainer hierarchy. So it's not an either or. You, you can do commit rights in, in kind of a leaf maintainer tree uh, while still having all the benefits of, of, of kind of the Linux kernel massively scalable uh, maintainer hierarchy. And yeah, like, like I, I hinted at a few times, it's, it's now rolling out for the DRM MISC tree. There's definitely a bit more work there needed because some of the bits are missing, some of the ingredients. So those need to be addressed. But even there, by just starting to do that, I, I managed to trick one, two people who but definitely not up for, for maintainership into helping out a lot, which I think already made it worth it. So, questions, where's the queue? There's, there's an entire pile of questions there. Yeah, so, uh, I will commit you, you, you didn't explain using your own tree internally and then you make it or, or people are committing directly to, to No, it's, it's all public. So all the DRM graphics development is, is, is all public. So, so people are just, like, it's 15 people are just upsync directly. Whenever they come yes. to it, it's upsync. It's, it's the public tree on, on freedesktop.org and it's the same tree that I use to send pull requests to Dave Bailey. I mean, if, you, if you're interested in Really complicated graphs, like the one we've just seen about Kork. Uh, in the documentation, there's an SVG that shows about all the trees we have, including hinting at how the internal ones look like and how it all flows. So, so yeah. Because, because, why, why do you do this instead of like, uh, I mean, why do you choose this way as opposed to having people work on like a clone? Oh no no no! People don't develop on the upstream tree. No, no, they have their own trees, of course, no, no, and clone. Yeah, but, but they could, uh, I don't. Garrett is horrible, sorry. <laughs> because you were talking about the reviews and all these things, but Garrett, for example, has you to look for rules and keeps. Well, I'm talking pretty much wrong. Yeah, I guess that's, that's Greg's talk. And if the question is why don't you use tools, we, we use tools. Why don't we use Garrett? Talk with Greg. Okay, ne next one. Behind you. Uh, we have a few like co-location places where people pile up, but essentially we're fully distributed. I'm working from Basel in Switzerland. 
the next person is probably about 500 kilometers away. So we, we don't work like a proprietary internal team at all. We do everything in the open. We are uh, essentially fully distributed on three continents or something like that. So th that's why I think this works. And the thing is with DRM-MISC, it's two people from Intel, some, one person from Google, uh, from Samsung, from Lenaro. So it does work if you are a real open source project and not just if you're a co-located team. I guess that was your question. Okay, next one. And I guess all of this we can switch to there. Behind you is, is one. So I didn't quite capture if you were on if you're taking uh pull requests or something that you're mostly just applying for each of your main things just to kind of practice the scale that you're each taking pull requests from a bunch of other people. Uh my second slide was why I want, don't want sub maintainers to take pull requests from them. It I think it's you need to do it once you're past the first, a certain size, but I think for 15 people, it's really inefficient. Because having multiple trees means you have conflicts between them, like all the time. Uh, the conflicts are, there's lots of communication with, oh, pull this, oh, it conflicts, and they don't get what it does, please resolve it, then the next. <laughs> Whereas if you just have one tree and, and everyone just applies on top, if it conflicts on the tree, they can fix it directly and run it through CI again, and if it's any other conflict through the scripting, we have the person who pushes results the conflict right there. When so they if I look at the Mesa team, the OpenShield user space driver part, uh, I think there are about fifty people. And it works perfectly fine there. I guess once you don't, once once you pass the point where everyone knows everyone else, and you don't have kind of the benefits of the mesh collaboration, uh, I guess then it, it starts to make sense to split things up and kind of formalize the communication between teams by having maintainers whose job it is to facilitate that. But I think fifteen people is. Definitely not at the limit, and probably not even close. Uh, questions from that side? Nothing? Yeah. yeah you, you said you, you take the same, uh, what kind of patterns that you need to have to know a little bit about what the other people in your team are doing on their code, or you take the same thing? Okay, maybe. No, no. I, I think the responsibility is how how you manage that. Um, so taking the blame is externally. When something blows up and someone externally complains, uh, I handle it. And I then make sure it gets resolved. We update our tools and documentation to make sure this doesn't happen again. Or if it's just a bug report, that, that bug report gets handled. And so so Taking the blame in that thing, as in again, I, t I I I take care of the external communication and and handling this kind of stuff. And like I said, I still follow what the team is doing. And in the areas where I know a lot, where I'm kind of the expert, I still review patches, of course. So it's not like totally hands free, hands off. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's, it's just like a lot of the boring stuff fell off. People don't ping me anymore for random patches. Even external contributors. I mean, a really great example is, is uh, someone from Red Hat wanted to fix a bunch of uh, bugs in, in, the, in the driver that they have on their machines. And I first just connected them to the right people in that area. And they started working directly together and after half a year I figured that person is, knows things so well I might as well give them direct commit access. I told them, here's the docs, here's the tool, do it. You know how to do it. So, I, I, in that entire thing, the only interaction I had was at the beginning point them at the right people. Two, three times. 
And that was it. And in the past, it would have been like for every patch, I would have needed to repeat that. Look, you really need to work together with that person. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So, so that's kind of all the work that fell away there uh, that I don't have to do anymore. And it's kind of the, the really annoying part of being a maintainer. All that bureaucratic stuff. Oh, anything else? Or that's it? So, thanks a lot for listening.